3D platformers were absolutely my favourite genre growing up. Things like Rare's classic collectathons, yes, even Donkey Kong 64, Spyro, Rayman, Mario 64, of course, this list could go on forever. So when Numskull reached out to me and asked me whether I wanted to review their upcoming 3D platformer called Clive and Wrench, I jumped at the opportunity. Pun intended. A new game that draws inspiration from all of my childhood favourites, made by a super passionate developer who loves all of the same games that I do. How could I say no to that? And this special edition here comes with some really cool little extra features too. I really love what they did with the instruction manual. It really took me back to the good old days where I would sit down as a kid and study the Mario 64 manual to figure out all of the different moves that he could pull off. So the game seemed like it was off to a fantastic start. This game's going to be a Amazing, right? Well, unfortunately, it's not as good as I was hoping. So let me tell you everything there is to know about this game in my review of Clive and Wrench. Here we go. There's definitely glimpses of a great game here though, one that lives up to the nostalgia and gives it a modern coat of paint. But then there's also times where the game just completely falls apart. It's definitely a rough experience, but I didn't want to just write the game off though. So I did sit down with it over the past few weeks and actually completed the entire game. It actually took me around 11 hours to complete, so it is a really big adventure. So after many hours of collecting things and struggling with some very awkward platforming, I did finish the entire game, and here is my completely honest review. So the game begins with a brief cutscene setting up the plot for the game. You basically have to stop this evil doctor from stealing a time travel device that your cousin Nancy invented. To do that, for some reason you jump into this 1950s style fridge and travel across different time periods collecting ancient stones and pocket watches along the way. The story doesn't take itself too seriously, it's all very nonsensical, but for a game like this, I really don't feel like the story needed to be anything more than this, and I did really enjoy the cutscenes and all the little bits of humour that were thrown in there too. So you play as Clive, this rabbit here, with a monkey named Wrench on his back. It's a classic 3D platforming duo, and although Wrench doesn't really do or say anything much throughout the entire game, he is a fun sidekick to have along for the ride, and using him to attack and do the helicopter style hover ability is just really fun. So after that intro sequence, the game began and I was thrust straight into the hub world, and unfortunately the first thing I noticed was how sluggish everything felt. Plus the fact that it was only running in 1080p and 30 frames a second on the PS5, that was actually very shocking. Apparently it is being addressed in a day one patch though, so for everyone watching this video you will actually have a much better experience than I did personally. So I'm not going to dwell on that fact because it is going to be fixed soon. So after jumping around a little bit in the hub world, we went off to the tutorial area. And this is actually designed like a test room blockout, the kind that you'd find in an alpha build of the game. It's pretty cool, but it did feel kind of out of place compared to the rest of the game. And for some reason, this test area is the only thing that Nancy tells you about in the hub world throughout the entire adventure. I thought she would remark on your progress throughout the game or give you some tips and tricks as to what's coming up next. But no, she always just presumes that you'll just forget the controls for some reason and want to go back in here but throughout my entire time playing I had no reason to return to this area whatsoever. And the tutorial room did not leave a good first impression. The controls were very unresponsive. Sometimes the double jump seemed to work, sometimes it didn't. Sometimes you can grab onto a ledge, sometimes you just fall to your death. It all just feels very unpolished. And the swimming physics are just completely broken. This is not what water should act like. Compare it to Banjo-Kazooie here and you'll see that it feels like you're in water, whereas in this game, for some reason when you're turning around you can just fly around all over the place and it's very very strange and they kind of forgot the fact that you can actually swim in this game too there are water sections in some of the levels but there's never anything to do or find in the water whatsoever so it does seem like a kind of pointless addition to the gameplay 
Another very frustrating thing that I noticed straight away was how slow the camera moves. It's frustratingly slow, and it even made me feel a little bit motion sick at times, when I was expecting to see the camera move much faster than it actually did. But hopefully this is something that can be fixed in an update, because it would make the whole game feel a lot better. I was kind of surprised that there wasn't a sensitivity slider in the options menu. The only option for the camera is to invert it or not, so that is a huge oversight and something that really soured the entire experience for me. As well as the controls being unresponsive, your attacks don't really seem to have any impact either. As soon as you attack an enemy, they just sort of float away, and frustratingly, sometimes the attacks don't even register properly, and you end up getting hurt instead of hurting the enemy, which makes for some incredibly frustrating moments in boss fights later on in the game. And with these really imprecise and floaty controls, it can be extremely frustrating to do some of the precise platforming that the game demands of you later on. Honestly, it took me about two hours to get past this section, and I was actually ready to give up here, but for the sake of the review, I persevered and I finally got through it, but it was so frustrating because I knew that it wasn't for my lack of skill that I couldn't get through this section. It was just the awkward camera angle, the unresponsive controls, and the fact that that it just doesn't feel that good to play, honestly, all combined together to make it a really frustrating experience, in this level in particular. And one of the selling points of this game was the fact that all of your moves are actually unlocked right from the start, and sure, that's cool, you get all of your basic platforming abilities, like a hover, a double jump, a high jump, but that's it, there's zero upgrades or anything to make the game feel fresh across its entire 11 worlds. It all starts to blend together and become a bit of a drag after the fifth world or so. I'm not really sure that having all the moves unlocked from the start is the sale pitch that they think it is. Sure, in Mario 64 you had your moves at the start, but there were still new inventive things to find and look forward to throughout the adventure to make it feel worthwhile, like the flying cat, Metal Mario, etc. Even Banjo-Tooie, you start the game with all the moves from the first game, but then you gain new abilities to make traversing the environments even more fun down the line, that open up new possibilities and ways to keep the game fresh and exciting. Not having anything to aim for throughout the entire game made every level feel exactly the same, and it made the pacing feel quite flat as well. Each world also ends with a boss fight, some of which are actual bosses, and some are the platforming challenges that I mentioned a bit earlier. The bosses are well designed, but due to the slippery controls, they aren't that much fun to actually fight, and most of the deaths will actually feel like something that happened out of your control, which is really frustrating. So in terms of the game's structure, the game centres around the hub area, with with each area branching out into a space where you can enter the stage or face the boss for that world after you've picked up a certain amount of key items. Inside these areas there's a few things to collect and a few enemies scattered around too, and once you defeat the boss then the door to the next world opens up. Apart from the first level, which for some reason is a Honey I Shrunk the Kids reference, the rest of the game takes place across different time periods and locations throughout history. There's 11 different worlds in total, and all of them are quite big in scale too. It's actually really impressive that this was done mostly by one developer. I loved entering a new world and getting that feeling of adventure with the possibility to just run off in any direction and start collecting things straight away. They all looked great too, and you can tell that clearly a lot of effort went into creating the environments and making them all feel unique. Like I said though, the fact that there's not really anything in terms of gameplay to differentiate all these levels feels like a bit of a missed opportunity. There's nothing to make you feel excited to progress apart from just seeing a new level theme. Which might be fine for someone new to the genre, but for a veteran like me, I'd like a bit more originality and some more new and exciting things to unlock along the way to make the game a bit more memorable as time goes on. Most of the levels themselves though are designed quite well, and they all have multiple different paths to take, as well as the fact that they expand at certain parts in the level, opening up to make them even bigger than you first expected. All without feeling overwhelming too, which is quite a challenging thing to do, and I did just enjoy running around these stages for the first time and uncovering these new areas and secrets myself. So of course, no 3D platformer would be complete without a huge list of collectibles to find, and this game is no exception. There's a few different things to find here. First, there's different coloured stopwatches which are just scattered about everywhere. These are kind of like the music notes in Banjo, except each stage actually has a different number of them to find. Something I really loved about this was the inclusion of a radar system. 
So if you don't know where to look, if you've almost 100%ed the level, but there's just one or two things that you couldn't quite find, you can actually press up on the D-pad and a radar will pop out of your character and it will actually take you directly to the pickups that you missed, which is a great touch. And it stops the game being too frustrating in that sense. The next big thing to collect are keystones, and each level has 10 of these. They're basically this game's equivalent of the Jiggies, or the dragons to find in Spyro, or the stars in a 3D Mario game. Each one also has a riddle that accompanies it in the logbook, and these are usually just scattered somewhere about the stage for you to find, or revealed when you press a switch in the level and then you have to run to where it was revealed before the timer expires. And these are all really fun to track down and try and collect too. There's also one in each stage which is linked to collecting something specific for one of the NPCs in the level. For example, you have to collect some fruit for this shop owner here, or you have to find all of the bees in the first stage, and then go back and talk to the NPC that asked you to collect all that stuff in the first place. Each level also has five golden keys to collect, and these unlock a safe somewhere hidden in the stage which contains one of the keystones. There is one really weird oversight with the collectibles in this game though, and it's something that every other 3D platformer seems to have done since the beginning, since Mario 64 basically, and that is the fact that there's no way of actually checking what collectibles you've found in a level from outside that level itself. So if you open the logbook on the hub world, you're literally just told that there's nothing to collect because there's nothing to collect in the hub world. You actually have to go back to a level and open the book from within that level to actually see whether you've actually missed anything or not. That just seems like a huge oversight and something that was solved literally nearly 30 years ago. So the fact that it's missing from this is a very strange thing. The NPCs in the levels all talk like that goofy Banjo-Kazooie or ukulele style, which I absolutely love. And there's even a cameo of Trouser from the ukulele game in this too. But for some reason, the text boxes and the animations for the characters are strangely static. It doesn't give you the same kind of fun impression that I think they were trying to go for. Plus, sometimes the text is so incredibly small that I couldn't even read it on my 60-inch TV. And even weirder, the NPCs don't really do anything. Most either just say random things and ask you to collect something, before just doing absolutely nothing once you've actually accomplished that task. They just stand there. Sometimes the chat icon actually still appears above them, even though they've got literally nothing to say. It's just very strange, and it just feels very unpolished. There are some really nice cutscenes at the end of each stage though, and these are actually really well animated, which makes it even more jarring to see the lack of animation and polish in the main game itself. The music and sound effects on the other hand was a massive highlight for me, I really loved the soundtrack for this and I'm very glad that they did include a soundtrack CD in this collector's edition too so I'll definitely be ripping that onto my computer later and giving it all a listen. It really did give me that feeling of playing games back in the 90s again, in a good way. I really do think they did a fantastic job with the music and sound effects. And the graphics, for the most part, as you've probably seen while you're watching this video, generally look really good and they definitely fit the theme very well too. As the game went on, I did notice that the graphics actually got better and better, but there were a few prominent issues with the graphics from a technical viewpoint. Several times I would turn the camera around and parts of the level would just disappear into thin air. They would just flicker in and out of existence. This was especially bad in indoor areas where the camera got too close to the wall, where whole parts of the level would just disappear. And I'm not allowed to show it in the video, but the second phase of the final boss honestly has some of the worst pop-in that I've ever seen in my life in any game, even in really badly programmed Sega Saturn 3D games. It was just honestly shocking. 
And as well as all the Graphicon glitches, there were also times where the collision detection was just non-existent. Earlier in the game, you're taught how to climb poles like this, so I tried it on the lampposts in this stage, and I just went straight through them. There's also some areas where it seems like you should be able to go, but the collision detection's all broken and you just end up sliding around until you fight with the controls to get yourself back onto the main level, or you just fall to your death. One thing I did love about the graphics though was all of the puns on the objects and the buildings in the game. There's just so many jokes and plays on words and puns. Even every single one of the collectibles had an associated pun with it. I could really tell the developer had a lot of fun coming up with those. So, in conclusion, I did end up completing the game, and despite the many complaints that I had about it, it's not completely unplayable, and I did have some fun with it too and I can tell it was a massive amount of work for the developer, who actually spent 10 years of his life painstakingly making this game. So it's kind of sad that after all that time and effort, the game still falls short of greatness. There's just too many issues preventing it from becoming a classic. With a lot of polish though to fix these technical issues, and some time spent on just making the game feel better, it really could have been a classic that would be fondly remembered as a great entry in the genre. But unfortunately, it falls short on so many levels that it's just hard to recommend in its current state. I really did want to love it and I really hope the developer keeps trying to make these kind of games in the future because there is a spark of something really great here, but it's not here yet. I hope you enjoyed my review of Clive and Wrench. Let me know in the comments below whether you've played it yourself. Let me know whether you think I was being fair or kind of unreasonable in this review. I did want to make a completely honest review and these were just my honest opinions. Of course, go ahead and make your own opinions. The game is on sale as of today as this video is going live. So thank you so much for watching. And if you do want to see another review of an indie game that I made, you can click up here and watch this one for an awesome game called Grapple Dog which I really enjoyed a lot. That's all for now. I'll see you all again very soon for the next episode. Goodbye.